So I went and saw the Joker the other day, and I gotta say, I thought it was excellent. I thought it was a near masterpiece, honestly. If it's not quite a great film, uh, I don't know, it's pretty darn close. Pretty darn close, I really liked it. Uh, it's heavily influenced by Scorsese, so much so, in fact, two movies in particular, King of Comedy and Taxi Driver. So much so, in fact, is it influenced by Taxi Driver, it's practically the same story arc and the same structure of Taxi Driver. It's pretty close to the same, same basic premise, same basic idea as Taxi Driver. King of Comedy, if you don't know the film, uh, it's not quite as well known as some of the other Scorsese flicks, but it has a really strong cult following. I know at least two people who insist up and down that it's the best Scorsese of them all. It's the best movie of them all. Because it's really weird. It's a little out of the box for him. It's, it's very reminiscent of this film. It follows his character, Rupert Pupkin, who actually, uh, the fact that De Niro plays the, the talk show host in this film is a direct reference. Rupert Pupkin is a very similar character to the Joker, and he's obsessed with uh, com becoming a comedian. So it's kind of a mashup of those two films, so much so that it follows the structure of Taxi Driver in a way. I really only have two complaints about the movie, and they're very minor. As, as a movie in and of itself, uh, I really thought it was effective and powerful as a case study in an isolated loner who slowly transforms into a homicidal maniac. I could almost recommend it just on the strength of the acting alone. Joaquin Phoenix plays the main role, and he so thoroughly inhabits the character, and he's so convincing, and he brings it, he makes it so real that I could recommend it just as just as a masterclass in acting. It, it's worth seeing just as this is how you perform on screen. This is how you completely take on the role of another human being on screen. It's a, it's a totally awesome performance. Again, I really only have two complaints about the movie itself, and they're very, very minor. Um, the first complaint, the character, if you are going, uh, for the people who watch my videos, uh, if most of you probably have seen it, I'm pretty sure you're going to like it. <laughs> if you like Taxi Driver, it's very close in structure. It's a very similar idea. It's kind of as a, uh, as a case study. This is really the only complaint I have about it. As a case study in how an isolated loner transforms himself into a homicidal maniac. His spiritual degeneration and the world just beats up on him to the point where eventually he snaps and becomes a homicidal maniac. It's absolutely excellent on those terms. It's thoroughly believable, thoroughly well acted, and a convincing portrait of, of that. It isn't really the Joker. It, it really isn't. It's very hard to imagine. What they leave off the table is that the Joker is a criminal mastermind and very cunning and a devious, evil genius. It's really hard to imagine this particular character transforming himself from the homicidal maniac that he turns into in the end of the film to the Joker that we know from the comic books and the other movies. It's really hard to see how this... He doesn't seem particularly smart. <laughs> he doesn't seem particularly like he's, he's about to, like, you know, hold the city hostage through, through ingenuity alone anytime soon. That's the only part about it that, that is my criticism of it. Um, there will be spoilers from this point forward, so if you haven't seen the movie and you're going to see it, I suggest you stop listening and go check it out. Uh, like I said, if you watch my videos, most of the people who watch my videos are going to like it, I think. I think you're going to really like it. I really liked it. It's just my only complaint. It's a great movie as a study, as a case study in how an isolated loner transforms into a homicidal maniac. The acting is great. You thoroughly empathize with the character and his transformation. All the pain he goes through becomes really real. It's really visceral. You really feel for the guy a lot and often in the movie. It just doesn't seem like the Joker. It's really hard for me to... I mean, I can't imagine how they would have left... How they would have added it, but they kind of leave completely off the table the idea that this guy is an evil genius or super intelligent or really, really uh, a criminal mastermind in any way, shape, or form. They completely leave it out of the film. They don't address it at all. And I can't see how you would add it to this particular character and make it convincing. But... Ultimately, if it's to become the Joker that we know from the comics and from the other movies, 
there's going to have to be a new, another transformation that takes place in this particular character where he gets some sort of like, you know, really intense intelligence because it just doesn't seem to be there in this particular guy. It's, uh, like I said, it's more similar to Travis Bickle than it is to the, the actual Joker that we know from, from, the other, from the other movies and from the comic books. It's, but as a case study in how an isolated loner becomes a homicidal maniac, excellent. Excellent. Very powerful movie. Very well done. A lot of things about it. A lot of moments in it that I thought were really first rate. The only other criticism I have, again, it's minor. There, there's scenes towards the end where after he has gunned down people in the New York City subway, he kind of becomes a cause of celebra. And the, the people are, are starting to dress like, dress in clown masks and people are kind of rallying to the cause and they're becoming jokers and they start to turn the city upside down and there's these scenes of rioting and anarchy and they're really powerful scenes. The guy, school, for some mysterious reason, he scores it to cream. In a white room with black curtains. It's a really, really not that good classic rock song. So he scores it to a mediocre classic rock song and it kind of really undercuts the power of it. That again, I said, it's a minor point. These are, these are two very minor points. Uh, his, the, the person who he's following, Scorsese, does that particular type of scene a lot. He does a montage that he scores to classic rock uh, to, to, dramat to underscore the power of the scene you're seeing. But Scorsese almost routinely picks a good song. Most of the time, it's Gimme Shelter. Honestly, he's done it at least twice to Gimme Shelter in the songs, and it's a lot more effective. Uh, this guy should have picked something else because Cream is just not powerful enough of a band. It's kind of like a, if you don't know Cream, it's kind of like a 60s classic rock staple, really kind of a mediocre band, honestly. Eric Clapton was in them. They're, they're overrated. They're not that good. Uh, this particular song isn't very, isn't very gripping, so it doesn't work as this, you know, he should have chosen Monkey Man, should have chosen the Rolling Stones. Monkey Man would have been perfect. Um, other than that, though, as, again, as a case study, the acting that Joaquin Phoenix brings to the table, he thoroughly inhabits the character and he makes you really feel. The, the movie really makes you empathize with the character. I guess that's what the controversy is about. Apparently there's some dust up with the PC police or after this particular film too. For what reason, I'm not really sure. Uh, I've become really, really an expert at totally avoiding these, these whatever the, the outrage du jour is on, on the daily... You know, I'm really, I'm really so tired of it. You know, we can't, we can't enjoy anything for what it is anymore. You have to, you have to be outraged because it's not this, or it doesn't quite do this, or I don't really know what the dust-up is. I imagine it's because you do wind up empathizing with the character of the Joker through most of the film. For about three-quarters of the film, it's all about him, and it's all about how the world is doing him wrong, and he lives in a cruel world and totally indifferent to him, if not act outright persecuting him. And it's, you really feel what it's like to be an isolated loner. You really get inside the character and you empathize with them a lot. To the point that by the time he finally starts to snap and he's gunning down people in the New York City subway, the scene itself is kind of a reference to Bernard Goetz. Some of you might not know this. It was a big story in the 80s in New York where I grew up. Bernard Goetz, similar idea. Bernard Goetz gunned down three, three guys who were... They didn't actually rob him. It... it Originally, when the story hit the paper, people were cheering on Bernie Getz because it looked like, you know, subway vigilante fights back. He guns down three guys who had a knife, but it wasn't clear that they were actually mugging him or if he jump, just jumped a gun and thought they were going to mug him and then there was race involved. So originally, people were like, yeah, Bernie Getz, subway vigilante, and they were cheering him on, very similar to how the Joker played out in this movie. Um, but then the story got more complicated and it wasn't clear that these guys actually attacked him as just they were being a little bit, you know, rough around the edges and they were all black and he was white. So as the story played out, it wasn't clear if this guy was, was somebody to praise or what. But the original, imp the original story, when it hit New York, everyone was, everyone was kind of cheering on the subway vigilante fights back. Very similar to what happened to the Joker. Now, but in the movie, The Joker, you're kind of rooting for him. That's probably what the controversy is about, because when he actually pulls out the gun and starts gunning down these three guys, you thoroughly hate these guys, and they they're, looked like they were about to rape a woman, and they're beating up on him for no particularly good reason. 
So you're not, it's very ambivalent. <laughs> you're kind of like half cheering them on. Like, yeah, you know, okay, it's not right to kill him, but these guys kind of kind of earned it. And the movie is somewhat ambivalent about his snapping altogether. It winds up making a point towards the end where he says, you know, this is more or less, this is what happens to, to when you disregard your people, your damaged people in your society. You've earned this. When he finally snaps for real and he kills, um, he kills the Robert De Niro character. The kind of the underlying, the underlying premise that he's saying in the movie yeah, kind of half agrees with them that you earned this. It's the cruelty and the indifference of the world that we live in and how we treated this guy so poorly and we don't care about him so that he, he you know, degenerates right in front of our eyes and grows up into something fearsome that comes back to haunt us and bite us. And it's, it's, it isn't quite an essay like that. But that's the implication in the movie. It, as, an, as a movie, the implication makes that storyline a lot more interesting and a lot more compelling. It's not necessarily an essay on sociology, but it kind of reaches for that towards the end to make a point. And that just underscores the power of the film. So as a movie, it's totally effective. As a sociological piece on you know, how to take care of the mentally ill, I'm not quite sure if it's all that effective. It's a lot more complicated than that. But there's a lot of interesting points to the movie. There's a lot of ambiguity. There are certain scenes in the film, for example, he's dating this, or at least I thought he was dating, <laughs> this black woman who lives next door. There's this African-American woman. And at one part in the film, he does his first killing, and he, he, he seems to get all charged up by it. And now it's emboldened him to go and knock on her door and start what looks like making out with her and then making love with her that night because he's, he's such a changed man by his killing has transformed him into something of a go-getter. And it's convincing. And then she's, she seems to be his girlfriend. I didn't realize that he was imagining her the whole time. I was a little bit like, wow, how did that happen? And it was slightly implausible, but I kind of went with it. You know, the idea was he killed somebody and now he's got the gusto to get the girl. You know, killing has invigorated him. So I went with the premise, and I didn't real, quite realize that he was imagining the girl, which gets interesting later on, because there's a whole storyline here that's going to probably reassert itself as this movie takes its place in the Marvel or the DC universe, where his mother is insisting that he is the uh, illegitimate child of Thomas Wayne, and she's sending Thomas Wayne letters to try and get him to take care of his kid. Now, the movie makes kind of clear that she's deluded, but it's vague enough, and I've heard some theories, that she isn't deluded. And the movie, it, it's, I can find it completely plausible. Uh, let's see if, this, if I can explain this better. His mother seems to think that he is Thomas Wayne's son. So he starts to believe her, and he goes to meet Thomas Wayne. Now... Thomas Wayne tells him he's deluded and that woman was crazy, his mother. And then you find out when he goes to the, to the mental hospital to check her records that she was in fact deluded, but it's still kind of suspicious. You don't know. It, it seems to me like the, the pat explanation of, of what actually happened seems like it was something written down for the benefit of the records and it isn't actually true. Now that's theories that I've heard and I find them slightly plausible. So it could actually be that he is Thomas Wayne's son and hence brother of Bruce Wayne or half brother of Bruce Wayne. Um, again, the movie's vague. The movie's a couple, vague on a couple of points where you're not sure what you're seeing and what's real and what's not. And I tend to think that that was one of the points. So. That's, that's what some of the fan theories are on the subject. I tend to think that they're right. It's a little too... The explanations for her... The, the, the fact that they were so... They were so um, stressed out by the mention of her name implies that there is more to the story than it was just some deluded weirdo who used to work for him. Because they kind of react... Very, when he says that she, who he is, when he says he's Arthur Fleck, they kind of... You know, they, they, they freak out at her name. 
which would imply that there's more to the story than just it's some deluded person who's trying to say that Thomas Wayne is his father. But it's not clear one way or the other. Overall, though, I really got to say, as just a standalone film, as a case study in how an isolated loner, uh, you know, someone on the margins of society starts slowly transforming through a series of events into a homicidal maniac, as a case study in that, if that sounds interesting to you, you will like the movie a lot. I thought it was a really powerful, really good film. Almost as good as Taxi Driver, in my view. Taxi Driver is one of my favorite movies. And I, I really thought this was really good. Um, so, there you have it, kids. If you are someone who listens to my videos, my, I have a good guess that you will like this film. So, I would suggest you check it out. And that is all for now. Mass is ended. Go in peace. Amen.